All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for stopping by the channel. Appreciate you being here. Going to be continuing on with the video series, TDCJ, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Last video, I wrapped up the experiences with the Academy. And in this video, we're going to talk about first day reporting into the Styles Unit, meeting with the FTO, FTO meaning Field Training Officer, and how the first day went. Now, some people might think when you hire on with TDCJ, you go through your training and the first day you're just thrown right into the prison. They shut the door behind you. Inmates are climbing up the walls and hanging from the rooftops. And it's up to you to calm it all down, settle everything out, grab order, and take charge. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, in fact, I'd venture to say your first week there is very much going to be just like back in the academy. So, you graduate the academy, uniforms pressed out, everything's all looking good, you've got your assignment, unit assignment, you made contact with your FTO, you know when to report to, and you're ready to just hit the unit hard, you've been stuck in class for the last five weeks, death by PowerPoint, listening to the instructors. We're ready for the work to get started now. Let's, let's get in and get this job going. Well, all that comes to a screeching halt once you get to the unit. So, first impressions. We'd make contact with our field training officer here out called FTO. I've tried for the life of me for the last couple of days to remember this corrections officer's name and I, I can't for the life of me. So in lieu of a name, she's going to simply be referred to as FTO. I pull into the parking lot and it's a huge parking lot. We're talking super Walmart style parking lot. And there's this little building out front. The place is surrounded by a metal fence with razor wire and looking out it's a bunch of different concrete and metal buildings with really narrow and really long windows you can't see in them but they're there and there's a bunch of these buildings everywhere a lot of fenced in compound areas a lot of razor wire and four towers rising up into the air towers known as pickets inside the picket is a corrections officer with a couple of different types of firearms m16 shotgun pistol they're there to prevent escapes also to prevent anybody from the outside world breaking into the prison so i'm sitting in the parking lot and i'm just looking around kind of taking it all in okay this is the styles unit I had heard a lot of things about the Styles unit. Uh, usually in class, the, when we had new instructors, they would ask everyone what unit they were going to. And if the instructor had any insight, they would share it. If they had insight at a unit they had worked to, for instance, Sergeant Norman had worked at Polunsky unit. So anybody going to Polunsky, she would share some of her experiences with that. Nobody had been to the Styles unit that I had worked with, and they had simply heard rumors, stories, pre-service cadets that get together and talk about their experiences. They had nothing good to say about the Styles. Since they had nothing good to say about it, they couldn't say a whole lot other than minor details that they had heard. So we all knew we were going into a prison, I say we because myself, there were four other cadets that were being assigned to Styles that lived in Beaumont at the time. So I'm sitting there with all this knowledge in my head, brains freshly filled with all the academy information. I really didn't know what to expect on walking in. When we spoke to our FTO, we were told, bring nothing with us. She had all of our paperwork 
Everything had been faxed from the academy. We didn't need to bring anything in with us. Just wear your uniform and report for work. We had to be there no later than 0800, 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay, no big deal. Got it. While we're in the parking lot, we're kind of hanging out. We're looking around for each other. We were finally able to catch each other. We had talked on Friday. What time were we going to try to get there? 7.30. Get there a little bit early. Got it. We go into, I don't remember what the building was actually called. It was your first point of entry into the facility. Everybody goes through shakedown, pat down before they go into this facility. Everybody. The warden on down to every civilian, every corrections officer, every maintenance employee gets patted down. This is to attempt to control incoming and outgoing flows of contraband into the unit. For corrections officers, we had to take our belt off, unbutton the pockets on your shirt, the pants pockets pulled out. You had to pull out the material from your front pockets, your back pockets. You had to take your boots off. They got ran through a metal detector. To help speed up the process, I had already had my belt off, hanging over my shoulder, all that done. The boots I wore had the side zip. You didn't have to unlace them, so I already had the zippers pulled down. When you walked in, there were two corrections officers. One was running and scanning the metal detector. The other one would pat you down. Put all your items in a bin, really similar going through an airport. Put all your items in a plastic bin, run it through, get patted down, put your belt back on, put your boots on. Then from there, you took your ID card, you passed your ID card to the officer working behind a glass door. This officer controlled the sally port. Sally port is uh, jargon for the entryway into the facility. You pass that ID card through the window, she opened the door, we all stepped in, door closes behind you. It didn't swing open, it slid. So it would slide open, it would slide shut. That's called rolling the door. From now on, we're gonna say roll the doors. Then she rolled the door open, we stepped in, door closed behind us. We took our ID cards, pinned it back on our shirt. Next door rolled open, we went through that, door closed behind us. At this point, we're out in the wide open surrounded by a fence line. We get to the fence, walk up to the fence, you put your hand on it, wait for the click, the solenoid to click, pull the gate open, walk through it, pull the gate closed behind you. From there, it was probably about a 50 yard length sidewalk. You walk down the sidewalk. Both sides, perfectly manicured grass. There were shrubs along the edge of the sidewalk, perfectly manicured, well taken care of. It, it looked like a professional landscaping crew had taken care of this. From there, you go into the main building. This is the admin building. Inside here was the warden's office, human resources, all the main, what's the word? the main admin staff for TDCJ, I'm sorry, for the Styles unit was inside this building. There were inmates that worked in there during the daytime. They were there to polish the floor, take out the garbage. They couldn't run errands. They couldn't, couldn't pass paperwork that could be used for contraband or intelligence against employees or other offenders. Classification. That was another big office that was in this building. Classification was what decided where offenders were going to be housed, what building they were going to be in, all the way down to what bunk they were going to be assigned to inside the housing unit. So that took place there. Offenders had what's called travel cards. Travel cards listed their name, race, date of birth, and a brief synopsis of the crime that they had been convicted of, those were kept in there. They were called travel cards because anytime the offender had to go to another unit, medical unit, or transferred to another facility, 
this went with the offender. The offender didn't carry it. The corrections officer doing the transport, as we talked about in our last video, motor transport. This officer kept that, and when they got to the new unit, passed it on to the receiving unit for further classification and processing from there. So we get into the building and we're brand new. You can tell we're brand new because our uniforms are brand new. We're kind of looking around, soaking it all in. And the corrections officer working the desk when we first went in told us to go down the hallway and wait in the visitation room. And we didn't know what the visitation room was. <laughs> So she said, just walk down the hallway, look in the window for the room with a bunch of tables and chairs in it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We go down the hallway. There's the door. There's another Sally Port officer, and we're standing at the door. We're staring at it. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We look around. We see her in there. Walk up to the window. It's not like a window in your house. It's thick plexiglass. Bullet resistant shatter resistant just thick plexiglass we get her attention she points to the room we walk back to it the door opens we go in we sit down we're the only ones in there so we're sitting there we're waiting we're waiting we're waiting some nervous conversation we're trying not to look scared there were offenders in there that were cleaning the floors so we're trying not to look brand new it's obvious we're new these guys have been there for years. They've never seen us. They know who the new recruits are. All right. Finally, we end up meeting our FTO. She comes in. I don't remember the time. She motions to us. We come to the door. The door opens. She tells us, come with her. We go down the hallway, and we had to stand shoulder to shoulder. Not shoulder to shoulder, I'm sorry. Left shoulder against the wall kind of wrap around the hallway since where her door was to the end of the hall as it curved around there was only room for two of us to stand there so we lined up right there and she went in her office we stood out there for probably a good 15 minutes or so i don't know if it was some kind of a discipline check but we stood in there and then she had all of us come into her office Nothing savvy about the office, desk, computer, two file cabinets, two chairs. I didn't take a seat. Two of the others I reported in with took a seat and we're standing there in her office. She introduces herself, we introduce ourselves, she pulls our paperwork out, hands us a stack of paperwork, tells us to look over it, Make sure everything's good, our names are correct, social security's correct, all that good stuff. Yeah. She tells us the first day is going to be the unit tour. First place we need to go, we need to go to human resources. We also need to go to medical. So the first place we go to, we go around the corner, human resources. She's leading the way, we're following her. Cool. Nothing bad's happening. All the offenders that are in there, they're just minding their own business, going about their thing. We go around the corner, we meet with human resources. I don't remember the lady's name. She takes our paperwork. That's gonna be a common theme. I don't remember anybody's names. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. She takes our paperwork, and then we meet with individual clerks who individually take our papers, make sure everything's filed, check our routing number with the banking institution that we had, had we received our first paychecks, yes, we all had, benefits, all of that's up to date, taken care of, commissary, did we sign up for it, yes, no, do you want to sign up for it, if so, how much do you want to contribute to it each month, once we were done with that, the FTO gave us a tour of, I guess we'll, we'll call it the admin building. That was where the main laundry room was, where officers would drop off their uniforms. You could drop off up to two uniforms a day. They would be ready by the end of the shift if you dropped them off at the first of the shift. Barbershop was in there. You could get your hair cut in there for free. 
by inmates. They weren't allowed to use scissors, but they did have clippers and they did have trimmers. And they were actually pretty, pretty good at it. And it was free. Showed us that. And then from there, we walked around to the main area. There was a hearing room that offenders would get brought into, and this is where they would meet with hearing officers and case managers to discuss cases, infractions, grievances. This went on all day long. There were probably around 2,095 inmates assigned to the styles when I was there, so that was a full day process. We step outside the door from there, and then from there, we're in the main facility. Her name is slowly coming back to me. It might get to me. The FTO turns to us. She holds her hands up in the air. We're now out in the open to the dreaded Styles unit that everybody's heard about. All these offenders around here, they're going to be talking all kinds of trash, calling you all kinds of words that I can't say here on YouTube. Profanity was just common talk there. It was as normal as any other word. I just can't say them here on YouTube. I'm going to be calling you all kinds of names. Be like a duck in water. Let it roll off your back. And as she's saying this, there's a cage off to our left. This is where offenders stayed. They weren't allowed to just mill around and wander about. Every offender had to be at a certain place at a certain time. If they weren't, that was a charge called out of place. So there was a cage where these offenders were held waiting to go into the detention room. And as she's talking, they stand up and every single one of them starts saying something. Uh, we got the new boss this year. Hey boss, what's your name? Boss lady, come on over here. Hey boss, let me tell you about this. Just doing whatever they could to try to get our attention. We tuned it out. We ignored it. Great. Walked down the passageway and it was a big, I can't paint the picture enough. There are no pictures inside of the facility because cameras weren't allowed in except for use of force purposes in-house TDCJ. We didn't have our phones, nothing like that. So there's no internal videos or anything of this facility. So we go down this long sidewalk and it's fenced on both sides and overhead was a fence with sheet metal all the way over it to prevent anyone from climbing and getting out up top. Plus, it somewhat shielded you from the weather, the elements. It kind of made, I'm trying to do a three-dimensional on a two-dimensional screen here. It, it very much made an L shape. As you went down this passageway, when that fence opened, you went to buildings one, two, and three. Behind us, behind the cage, was where the chapel was. There was another building there. I don't remember what it was because I never went in it, but I know the chapel was there. There was a long line of inmates standing out there ready to go into the chapel. Instead of going to building one and three, when you turn left, that ended at another fence. There were two metal buildings there. It had one and two on it. We didn't know it at the time. Those were one and two chow hall. Where we were at this fence, when this fence opened up, these were electronically controlled uh, solenoids. There was an officer sitting in a fenced-in area. This officer's job, there was a female there, her job was to control these doors. When someone would get to the gate, they'd stand there and yell out, GATE! Try to get her attention. When she noticed you, she popped the door. If you didn't wait, if you yelled out gate, and two seconds later you said it again, and then you said it again, you were going to be there for a long time. That officer was not going to acknowledge you. So, yell it once and wait. She will get to it. She opened that gate for us. We went in, and inside that area behind her was another metal building. That was the ODR. That was the officer's dining room where we could go in to eat food. They serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner in there, free of charge, prison food, served by inmates, not bad. I ate there all the time. Some officers never went. I, I really didn't mind it in the least bit. You go through another gate, you walk down this hallway, and there was chow halls, 
believe it was three and four. I could be wrong. It could have been one, two, three, four, or it could have been four, three, two, one. But either way, there were two more buildings uh, that were chow halls. So four chow halls for the inmates to eat in. You get to the same style fence that opened up to our right as you're facing the fence to our right that went on to buildings four five and six i believe i know eight building was back in there eight building was bad it was just bad eight building Historically, in TDCJ is where offenders who should be in segregation, but there's not enough room in segregation, but they can't be housed with other inmates, they're in a building. It's rock and roll in that building, and we'll talk about that in another video. So when the gate opened up, we take a left. That's where the law library was, the medical facility, and continuing on straight ahead from in there, couple of more fences to go through, and then you were in segregation. We didn't go back in that area. We went into medical. Met with the physician's assistant. She gave us the speech about if we're involved in use of forces with offenders, what we need to do. If an offender has a communicable disease, i.e. HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, and we get exposed to the fluids of that offender. HIPAA law does protect that individual. They can't tell us, you've just been exposed to blood that is infected with HIV, you need to be treated for this. They couldn't tell us that. That was protected under it. You were kind of on your own when that did happen. Now, they did have a way around that. Might get into that later on in videos. I'm trying to stick to the basics here with this one. So they gave us the talk about that. I kind of think this is also another reality check because I'm pretty sure a lot of new hirees when they hear this probably don't come back the next day. So this may be another way to gut check the realities of what we're walking into. First thing they test us for is TB. Take your arm, put the little the needle in it, press it in, give you the shot, it's going to give a little raised bubble. I've never tested positive for tuberculosis. I don't know what it does. I just know eventually the bubble goes away in about three or four days, and then you have to get treated again. All right. We were in there for a pretty good while. Once we got done with them, we reported back to our FTO. She had gone back to her office to do her thing. We got with her. She told us to go back out to where the chow halls were. It was close to lunchtime. Get ready to start patting down offenders. Make sure we had gloves. We kind of looked at each other, none of us. She reaches into her desk, pulls out a box of surgical gloves. We all pull out some rubber gloves, latex gloves, powder free. Put them in our pockets, go back out to the chow halls. On both sides, so we had the first two sets of chow halls, the officer controlling the fences, and then the other two chow halls, there would be a supervisor. Supervisor, either sergeant, lieutenant, captain. Typically, it would be a sergeant, maybe a lieutenant, very rarely a captain. They were there with the keys to open the doors. Offenders, at this point, were filing out of the buildings. Usually, it's called a shot of inmates. Send me, send me another shot. That, that would be what would go over the radio. The supervisor would get on his or her radio, send me another shot. That was code for the building, whoever was working the front desk in the building that the offenders were coming from, to let the next 25 come out. Got it. 25, 30, somewhere around that. So, our job, we broke up into groups. There were five of us, so odd number. Three went over to the left side, two stayed outside. Our job was, as offenders walked by and went into the chow halls, pull an offender out of the line, pat them down, see if they had any contraband on them, and then let them go. We couldn't do every single one. It was impossible. Lunch would take eight hours. And there were so many offenders to feed by the time lunch got finished. 
It was almost another two hours and it was time to start feeding dinner. It was just a long process because there were that many individuals to feed. So you pull one off, pat them down, see if they had contraband, let them go. It being day one, it's obvious we're brand new. So everyone we pulled out had something to say. I can't do this video without using, I'm not gonna use racial slurs, but there was a lot of racism that went on down in Southeast Texas and especially in this. Being a Caucasian corrections officer, if I pulled out a black offender, here it comes. I'm just the most racist CO in the world. Why am I pulling him out when I got all these other guys talking all kinds of mess to you just to see what you would do? If he started talking mess and you told him to go away, he knew he had won on you. Best thing to do, ignore it, go on about your job, pat him down. Likewise, the reverse racism. If I pulled out a white offender and started patting him down, why am I singling him out? I got all these other guys that I could have done, turning against this and that, supposed to stick together. Now, if I show favoritism to this offender, I'm not winning any kind of sides or any kind of battles. At that point, now I'm really showing reverse racism, so you got to watch that. That's, that's offender manipulation at its finest right there. And race was a big thing about it. Female COs, big check on female status. They would whistle, hoot, holler, tell you all kinds of nice things. Likewise, tell you all kinds of bad things just to try to throw you off your game and buddy up to you. It started immediately. I don't know how many offenders we were all able to pat down. You would think with five of us, we could get a fairly good number. They moved through pretty quick. And when the one got pulled aside, he'd take his time. we tell him, turn around, face away from us, put your arms out to your sides, walk your legs out to your side. You didn't want to say, spread your legs. You can imagine where that could go in a different kind of term. So you never said, spread your legs walk your feet out to your sides towards your shoulders. They do it, but they do it real slow. That was to let as many other offenders walk by to avoid the pat down. Pat this offender down, see if they had any contraband on them, let them go in the chow hall. Once they were in eating, when they came back out, reverse. Do the same thing. See if they were bringing anything out of the chow hall that might have been smuggled to them food, any other contraband, something. I don't remember how many hours we were out there. I remember it had to have been at least two hours. At this point, it's now, it's June in Southeast Texas. It is hot. We're on this concrete pathway, no airflow going in. Long sleeve shirts, rubber gloves, button up shirts, starched, ironed, leaning up and down, running our hands over these offenders, just covered in sweat. Absolutely covered. That's another reality to the job. It's physical, you're going to get hot, and it's going to be sweaty. FTO came to us, told all of us, gather up with her, good, asked us how that experience went, did we have any problems? Any offenders say anything to us? All that. Took us back to her office. It might have been around three by this time. She told us that that was it for the first day. Come on back, 0800 the next day. Meet in the turnout room like we did. So your first three weeks, you're not on shift. You're not reporting. There's, there's two groups. There's general population administrative segregation. Gen Pop has its own turnout room. Ad Seg has its own turnout room. Day shift, night shift. We weren't on any of those. We reported directly to her. So we're like, okay, eight to three. That's not too bad. All right, we got this. Cool. Went back to her office, told us that, report back. At that point, the same process that I said, how we got into the building, you do it to get out. When you get to the gate, 
you put your hand on the gate, it had a, a button for the speaker box. You push the button and you wait. You wait, you wait, you wait. You hear the solenoid click, you open the gate, walk in, close it behind you. She rolls the Sally Port door, slide the ID card in there, door closes. She rolls the next Sally Port door, go out, get your ID card. You didn't get patted down to leave. At that point, you just left. We all hit the parking lot, said, that was interesting, cool, good. Learned a lot more that one day than we did pretty much the whole academy because now you're dealing with offenders and they're talking to you like offenders talk to CEOs. Got in our car, went home. That's it for uh, day one. I really appreciate y'all sticking to this video, a little bit longer than I had planned on it, but I wanted to paint as best a picture so that way in the future videos can just talk about the experiences from there and not have to really talk about the layout of the area. In the next video, we'll talk about days two and three and what led up to getting on to our first shift assignments. Hope everyone has a great rest of y'all's day. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did so, let me know. Thanks for tuning in.